because Abram's overwhelmed and he sends him outside and he said I want you to look at the stars and then later on as you read you'll find that God he takes him to the sand he said count the sand so Abram had something to look at during the day and he had something to look at at night so the first thing you need to do if you know God has given you a dream and, and you're gonna find that God he needs you to fulfill his dreams they're not just for you they are for him he needs you to dream his dreams and and go after them believe him for everything and he gave Abram something to look at during the day he gave him something to look at at night and you need to find you something to look at during the day you need to find something to look at at night you'll find over in Joshua God told Joshua he said I want you to meditate on this law this word day and night in other words you need to change what you see so you can believe what God's wanting you to receive you need to find you some stuff. Do that vision board that Lacey just talked about. Get those things and put them on a board. Post them in your bathroom and in your car so that you can see those things and the reminders to you of what you're going after. So the first thing you need to do is you need to change what you see. And that's what God was trying to do for Abram. He was trying to change what he saw. See, it's not just about what you see physically. It's about renewing your mind and changing what you see on the spiritual side. That's really what faith is all about. It's about going after what you can't see physically. But on the other side of it, faith isn't about just living in the dark and just, just going through life like this. Faith is actually living by what you see with your spiritual eyes. And I truly believe that the, the imagination that God has given us, it is a doorway into the supernatural. It's a doorway into seeing things uh, by faith. You know, this imagination God has given you, have you ever noticed and, and we know it on the negative side because we do it all the time. Are any of you professional worriers? I, I know some professional worriers. I mean, these are people who, uh, the situation isn't even possible, but they've imagined it. And then if you ever notice that when you start to worry about something, that your emotions start to change and, and your heart starts to beat a little bit, you maybe start to get a little bit, some sweats and palpitations and and. and and, and you start to maybe get a little headache. I mean, your body starts reacting to what you're, what you're thinking about. You realize that when you worry, it's not going to change anything. But all it does is change you. It doesn't change the situation. But when you worry, that's what you're doing. You're imagining the outcome. You're imagining the circumstances. And that's on the negative side. But you need to flip it and, and do the opposite and put it on the positive side. You know, faith is actually the, the, the direct opposite of fear. When you get into fear and you're worrying, you're actually putting your faith in the negative stuff. Well, if you'll just turn around and, and, and when you worry and you know how to worry, do, do it the other way, do it the opposite, and that's how you, you stir up your faith. You start thinking about what God's going to do. You start thinking about God's promises. You start seeing yourself doing what God said you can do and start seeing yourself seeing and having what God said that you can have. You start seeing that instead of seeing what the devil is trying to bring your way. And that's what God was trying to do for Abram. This was such an impossible situation because Abram, he was 75. Sarah, she was old and she was barren. She could not have kids. And God is saying, I'm going to bring a child through this union, through this partnership. And Abram, at first it says he believed God, but how many of you have believed God for something? You said, I believe that. And then a couple of days later, well, I'm not so sure. How many of you have come to church and, you know, we, we, we worship and we hear a good message and we get our faith stirred up and we're going to believe God for the world. And then we get to lunch 15 minutes later and like, man, how's God going to do that? It doesn't take long. And you see it with Abram here. We're down to chapter 17. God's going to give Abram some more help. So not only did he tell him to change what you see, he didn't tell him to go, you know, sleep with, with the maid. He was talking about his wife. And in chapter 17 and verse 5, God said, No longer shall your name be called Abram, but your name is now going to be Abraham. For I have made you a father of many nations. The, the, the name Abram, it literally means an exalted father, but Abraham means a father of multitudes. Now, you got to understand, this is an impossible situation for Abram because now he's not just 75, now he's 86, or he's 85. No, he's 86. He's 86 years old now. And so he added on a decade after what God promised him that already seemed impossible. Now it seems even more impossible. 
And God's saying, not only are you going to have one, you're going to be the, the, the father of many, 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 many descendants, kings and princes. And then if you go on down in chapter 17, he not only changes Abraham's name, he changes Sarah's name to Sarah. And what's interesting is that the name Sarah, it means princesses. Isn't it interesting that he gave them a name that represented uh, not just singular, but plural? Many, 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 many. So he gave them something to change what they see, and then he caused them to change the way that they were talking. See, you can't be just go, going around talking any other way and expect to receive what God wants you to receive because what you say is always a product of what's in your heart. How many of us, let's take it from a financial situation, how many of us, we've seen in the scripture, seen the word that God said, I'm going to meet all your needs. I'll prosper you, I'll do this and that, and yet we're always going around talking about what it's like to be broke, and I don't know how I'm going to pay this, and I don't know how I'm going to pay that, and I don't know how in the world we would ever do that. I mean, the kids, they want to go to Disney, but I mean, we've never been able to get out of Jonesboro. I mean, a vacation for us is going down to Mark Free and going to Walmart. There's no way we could ever get to Disney World. You know, I remember when I was a kid growing up, I grew up in Beaumont, Texas, which was a you know, a town outside of, of Houston. And for us, I mean, we were broke as broke could be. A big deal for us was going down to Galveston and going and playing at the beach. And if you've ever been to Galveston, it's, I mean, it's a beach technically because there's water and sand. But it is one of the nastiest beaches that you'll ever go to. Because if you've ever been to like Destin or going to the beaches in, you know, California or Florida, I mean, the water's blue and the, the sand is white. Down in Galveston, the water's brown. And if you go out there, there's oil all out there, and there's just junk that's been dumped into it. I never knew why when, we, when I was a kid, we, my grandparents, they had this little beach cabin out there, and we'd go play. I never really knew why we did it. We just did it. But when we would get out from playing in the, in the Gulf of Mexico, we would come in, and there was a gas can sitting by the front door, and we would pour gas on our hands and, and rub all the oil off of our legs and off of our arms. <laughs> and then we would get a shower. I just thought that's what you do when you go to the beach. And when me and Lacey, we started dating, and I brought her home for the very first time down to Texas, meet my parents, and we went to Galveston. And I said, oh, we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to go down to the beach. I've never been anywhere else. Go down to the beach. And she looked at it, and she said, what's that? I said, it's the beach. Let's go swim. She said, I am not getting in that. Well, she had always gone to these beaches, you know, in California and Florida. I was like, well, yeah, but it's fun. I mean, you know, it's just a little bit of oil, no big deal. She wouldn't do it. She wouldn't even let the dog go out there. And then we went to Destin one time, and I saw what a beach actually is supposed to look like. So I won't get in the water in Galveston either. But it was a big deal for us just to do something like that. Never in my mind would I ever think I'd be able to go to countries around the world. That was just, that was way, way out there. Until I started getting a little bit older and started dreaming a little bit bigger. And all of a sudden, those numbers that seemed really big to me started getting really small. And that's one thing that I've found, too, that God, he not only wants you to dream the dream, but then he wants you to go past the dream and dream even bigger. Because now the numbers that used to be big to me, they've become small, but then there's bigger numbers. And I'm working on making those bigger numbers small so I can go after some bigger numbers, right? And so we should all be doing that, dreaming bigger and then dreaming bigger and dreaming bigger. But you're going to have to change what you see, and you're going to have to change the way that you talk because the Bible says that out of your mouth are words of life or words of death. You see it all throughout Proverbs that, 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 that the words that come from your mouth, they're going to produce in your life. You will have what you say. You see it over in the Old Testament. You see it in the New Testament. You're going to have what you say. You realize that your salvation is a product of you believing in your heart and confessing with your mouth. You realize there's a lot of people that, that believe in Jesus, but they've never made that true declaration from their heart that he is Lord, Lord over their life. And if that's the way that you receive salvation, then that's the way you're going to receive all the other benefits of salvation by believing in your heart and by declaring from your mouth. Look, if you hold your place right there and you turn over to 2 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 13, you see this as well. Paul makes this statement and he said, uh, therefore, since, well, here, I don't want to quote, I want to read it for you. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 
verse 13. This would be a good one for you to write down. If you're taking some notes or writing down some scriptures, it would be a good one to memorize. And just get this down in there. 2 Corinthians 4, verse 13 says, Since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. Therefore, we believe and we speak. He said, we have the same spirit of faith. In other words, I have this attitude. I'm going to go get what God has said is mine. I'm going to believe him for all of it. I believe it and then I speak it. I believe it and I speak it. And what God did for Abraham is he changed his name so that Abraham wasn't just walking up to people and say, I'm an elevated father. Now he's walking up to people and saying, hi, I'm a father of multitudes. I'm a father of multitudes. And you say that long enough, and all of a sudden you start to believe what you're saying. And once you start believing what you're saying, now you're in a position to start receiving what God has provided for you. See, this whole process uh, took over 20 years for Abraham and, and Sarah to eventually have a child. It shouldn't have taken that long. But God, he gave the promise, and then he's having to work on them and work on them and work on them. It wasn't God's problem. It was Abraham's problem. Abraham had to get into a position so he could receive from God what God had promised him many, many, many years ago. So God changes what he, gives him an opportunity to change what he see, and then he says, I want you to change the way that you talk. You're not going to say that you're just an elevated father. Now you're going to tell everybody that you're the father of multitudes. And I guarantee you that Abraham, you know, being 86 years old, he walks up to people and he says, I'm a father of multitudes. I guarantee you there was a lot of laughers. There are a lot of people that weren't uh, edifying him and building himself up and saying, yeah, you can do that, yeah. No, people don't see in you what God sees in you. And so that's why you shouldn't worry about what people have to say about you. I could care less. Yes, there, there's a part of us where, you know, uh, if you're not thick-skinned enough, when people say stuff, it kind of stings and it kind of hurts. But you've got to push that stuff off to the side because it doesn't matter what people say about you. It, what matters is what God says about you. And if you'll believe in your heart what God says about you, and then you'll begin to declare those things out of your mouth, what God says about you, then all of a sudden you'll begin to see things changing on the outside, and it'll start to look like what God sees on the inside. You need to change what you see, and you need to change what you say. We believe in our heart, and we declare it from our mouth. And so if you still got your place there in Genesis, uh, we'll finish up here if you turn over to Genesis chapter uh, 17. Let me flip back over there. Genesis chapter 17, so he changes Abram's name. And in verse 15, then he changes Sarah's name to Sarah. And in verse 16, it says, I will bless her and I will give you a son by her. And I will bless her and she will be a mother of nations. Kings of peoples shall be from her. Now, I know none of us have ever done what Abraham does here. But verse 17, after God gives him this magnificent promise, yet once again, it says, Abraham fell on his face and laughed and said, Shall a child be born to a man who is 100 years old? And shall Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? I mean, how many times have you, that dream kind of popped in your heart? Or you see, you know, you see a promise in, in the Bible, and, and maybe you never heard, uttered it, but on the inside you thought it, what in the world? I mean, how in the world is that ever going to come to pass? There's no way. And you kind of chuckle, you kind of laugh, and, and you just really, you just doubt God. I've been there. We've all been there. There's things I, I know I, that, that God has put on my heart, uh, that he's wanting me to do. And there's some things, I mean, I have to, I've had to work on it and work on it and work on it. I mean, it was so big and like it couldn't fit in. And so I have, I've had to work for, for months or sometimes some of these things, years, just to, just to enlarge my mind and my heart big enough just to get a piece of it in there. And, and the way that I enlarge my mind, enlarge my heart, is I got to change the way that I see and I got to change what I say. And as I do those things and keep making steps and keep making steps, all of a sudden my, my, my believer starts getting a little bit bigger. And I can squeeze some more in there. And once I get it all in there and I can see it and I know that I've got it, that's when it shows up. That's what Jesus talked about over in Mark chapter 11, verse 23, verse 24. If you can see it, if you can say it, you can have it. And when you know that you've got it, 
that's when you got it. That's when you got it. And so he changes their names. And, and then in uh, chapter 18, verse 11 says, Abraham and Sarah were old, well advanced in age. Sarah, she is past the age of childbearing. And Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I have grown old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? And the Lord said to Abraham, Why did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I surely bear a child since I'm old? Notice God's statement here, verse 14. He said, Is anything too hard for the Lord? And when you, that dream begins to show up on the inside of you, or there's those desires that, that you have to fulfill, those things that you want to do, and those questions and doubts start to come up and how in the world is this going to happen? Where's the money going to come from? How are the doors going to open to be able to do this? You need to ask yourself, is anything too hard for the Lord? Notice, he didn't talk about how hard it is for you. You'll find out, and I've found this out many times, that when God has told me to believe for something, he's never checked my bank account. He never said, before you do this, go see how much money you have. Let's see if you can actually have this. He's never done that. He's never done that. He's never told me to check my calendar. He's never told me to check the clock and see if there's enough time to bring these things to pass. He's never asked me to look at anything in the natural to see if what I'm believing him for is actually possible. See, faith, the faith life, it's actually fun. It's hard on your flesh. I mean, it's hard on your flesh. But it's fun because life is always interesting. And there's always new adventures in faith and new journeys and things that you can do for God. I mean, the life that you and I have been called to live in is the life of the impossible. The situations in life where people go, oh, there's no way. That's where you and I should get excited and say, yes, but God, with God there is. And I'm going to believe him for it, and you're going to watch it come to pass. I mean, if you've ever done this, I mean, you've ever, I mean, truly believed God for something, and you've seen it come to pass, I mean, it gets you excited, and it's like, okay, what else can we do? What else can we do together? So it talks about in the New Testament, it says that you and I, we are co-laborers together with God. We're working with Him together. He gives us the dream. We say, I believe that. And then God begins to bring it to pass. But you got to watch out and produce an Ishmael. You don't want no Ishmael. The Ishmael's come from you trying to bring it to pass. And what happens when you do that? It, it's because you became the performer instead of just the believer. You forgot your role. And so we see even Abraham, the father of faith, he laughed. And he doubted a little bit. And then real quickly, if you look over at uh, Genesis. And in uh, chapter uh, 19 and 20, you get on over to uh, 19 and 20, you see some wonderful things happen. And then verse 21, you find out that God's promise, it finally came to pass. And Abraham was 100 years old. And Isaac, the son of promise, was born. And through Isaac came who? Through his lineage came Jesus. And it was all because of one decision. Again, one decision to believe God. By faith, I received that. And he thought it was just for him. And, and never did he know all the generations it was going to impact. I mean, this has been the theme that keeps coming up, is that your faith, it'll not only change your life and your family, it'll change generations. If you want to have an impact on the world, believe God. If you want to have an impact on the world, you need to have faith in God and take Him as word. You never know who it's going to affect. You never know who it's going to affect. You never know whose life is going to change. You never know whose life is going to inspire to step out and say, I'll do that for God. You never know. I mean, that's what I'm trying to do for my child. I want him to see time and time and time again, God, he's faithful, he's faithful, he's faithful, he's faithful. Because that's the third thing that you need to do. If you want to go after God's dreams and fulfill the dreams that God has for you, number one, you need to change what you see. Number two, you need to change what you say. And number three, you need to judge him faithful. And you see that over in Hebrews chapter 11, uh, when it's talking about Abraham and Sarah. I want you to see this. Hebrews chapter 11. And we'll finish off right here. Finish off with this scripture. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 11. It says, By faith Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed, 
and she bore a child when she was past the age. See, I, I like the fact that it says that because here's the natural circumstances saying this ain't possible. But how does she, how does she receive strength? How does she receive this child? By faith. By faith. She received strength to conceive seed, and by faith she bore a child when she was past age because she judged God faithful who had promised. See, again, just because God promises it doesn't mean that it's going to automatically come to pass for you. You need to judge Him faithful. You need to say, I receive that. I believe that. I'll take that. I believe that what you said for me, it will come to pass. You need to change what you see. You need to change what you say. And you need to judge God faithful. Because it's interesting, if you read the rest of the story through there, you, you see that Abraham, the father of faith, you know, the, the guy who, who's a, a good example for us to follow, he laughed at God when God said, this is what I'm going to do for you. He didn't believe it at first. And when Sarah heard about it, she didn't believe about it. She laughed about it. That's why they, they called him Isaac. She laughed about it. She didn't judge God faithful at first. But at some point in the process, they began to look and they saw where God had been faithful here and God had been faithful here and God had been faithful here and God had been faithful here. Well, he'll be faithful in this situation too. And I do that many, many times when we're dealing with stuff. Not only do I go outside and look at the stars and I look at my little, little vision board, but I got like my little trophy case. And it's not actual little trophies like we know of, but I mean some of those trophies for me, they're, they're, they're bank deposit slips. You know, or it's, it's a testimony of healing from somebody. And these, these things, I can go back and I can look and I can see where God was faithful here and here and here and here and here. And so any time that I start to get a little fleshy and a little carnal and I start to doubt if what God says is going to come to pass, I can go back and I can look. And I can start changing what I see so I change what I think, so that I change what I say, so that I'm in a position to be able to receive what God said I want you to have. So say this with me. I judge God faithful. What God has promised me, it will come to pass in my life. There is nothing impossible with God. There's nothing that's too hard for the Lord to bring to pass in my life. What God has put in my heart, the desires that he's given me, I believe them. I'll go after them. Not only for me, not only for my family, not only for the world, but I'm going to do it for God. Because God has great plans for me. He's got big dreams for me. And I'm going to dream his dreams. And I'm going to receive his dreams. And then I'm going to go on to bigger dreams. And bigger dreams. And bigger dreams. And inspire all those around me to believe God and to judge him faithfully. Isn't it interesting? That's what God told Abram when he first met him. He said, I'm your shield, and I am your exceedingly great reward. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 11, he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. He's a rewarder, man. Brother Hagin used to say this all the time. He said, with God, payday may, may not be on Friday, but there's always a payday. It may not show up on Friday. It may not show up on Sunday. But there's always a payday with God. If you'll just judge Him faithful, you watch what you're looking at, you watch what you're saying, it'll come to pass. But you need to watch out who you're hanging with too. You don't want a bunch of doubters around you. Be careful who you share your dreams to. I don't talk about my dreams to too many people. Because most people, uh, they don't want to dream with you. Either if they, if they, we'll say this, a lot of people that's around you, they don't think it's possible. And if they don't think it's possible, they don't want it to be possible for you. And so they're going to try to bring you down. They just don't want you to have, and it's because they can't see it themselves. So be careful who you tell your dreams to. You want to tell your dreams to people that are dreaming bigger than you. Hang around people who think bigger than you. Dream bigger than you. Don't, don't hang around with the small fries. Hang around with, with the big fries. I, I was down in, in uh, we were down in New Orleans a couple of months ago at a conference uh, with the, the planets, and, and Jesse taught, actually during the service, there's some things he pulled me out and said, but he told me, he said, he said, you're dreaming too small. Now, I thought I was doing pretty good. 
And I was like, man, if you could see my vision wall, I mean, what I'm dreaming for right now is, oh, I mean, I can't even barely get, you know, peace in there. And he said, you're dreaming too small. And he said, you're not believing God for enough money. And he didn't know what I'm believing for. He said, you're not believing God for enough money because he said, what God has called you to do, you're going to need way more money than what you think. And I walked away from that with my head down because I thought I was doing pretty good. But then I began to realize, hey, there's some things I've been trying to figure out how to do it on my own. And I need to get away from that. I need to start dreaming bigger. I need to start thinking bigger. Me and Lacey, we actually got to go out on a little, little of a date the other day. And we were sitting there uh, at the Longhorn eating. And I looked there and I said, what's your dreams? What are you dreaming about? And, and so for a while, we talked about our dreams. Things that we're dreaming, believing for. Things that we want to accomplish. Things that you want to do. I mean, in one sense, everybody should have a bucket list. Some things, I mean, by golly... By the time I die, I'm going to have done these things. I'm going to receive these things. I'm going to accomplish these things. You need to have a road map on how, what, what you're going to go after. Praise God. You're going to start dreaming bigger? Believing bigger? Come on, don't, don't hang around with the small fries and dream their little dreams. You need to dream big, not only for you, but you do it for God as well. Amen. Well, look, before we go, we don't ever like to go without doing this. If you're sitting here this morning, you're watching online, and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior, you need to do that. You're not going to be able to dream God's dreams and do the things He wants you to do without that first step. And so if you're here this morning, you're watching online, you say, that's me. I've never done that. We want you to do that this morning. It'll be the greatest decision that you'll ever make, and I guarantee you it will impact generations. And so for the sake of those that are here and watching online, I want you to all pray this together. And then once we get done, if that was you, I want you to come up here. We've got some people that are going to pray with you, some things they'll give to you. Or if you are somebody, you just need somebody to pray with you about anything, come up here and they'll, they'll pray with you as well. Say this with me. Say, Father, come to you right now. And I realize I'm in need of a Savior. I believe in my heart and confess with my mouth that Jesus is the Lord and the Savior of my life. In Jesus' name. Amen. That simple. Ryan Casper. Casper. So, so tell me what was going on tonight. These are your hearing aids. These are my hearing aids. I have, not have to use them now. I hear very good. He got way down away from me and whispering, and I heard it. So you came, you came in with these hearing aids. Mm -hmm. Yes. Not, no, I don't need them no more. Yeah, but you came in with them. Oh, yes. I, <laughs> Having I, to use them. I had them in my yeah. ears. And I you took, took them out. You took them out when I came up. Right. And we just began to talk. We've been talking about the life of God on the inside. He's, he's a Christian. She's a Christian. Right. And, and as I, we were talking, and he didn't have the hearing aids, and I put the microphone away, and, and he wasn't noticed, and I started backing up a little bit more. We were having a conversation, and all of a sudden it hit him. Right. I'm here without yeah. my hearing aids. <laughs> Didn't lay hands on you? Didn't pray for you? It worked. Just the power of God? <laughs> you bet on the man. inside.